to celebrate uh, International Women's Day, we actually have, for the last session of the day, a reverse mantle. So does, I'm not sure if you guys know what a mantle is, but a, a mantle is a panel that only has blokes on it. Uh, so we're, we're celebrating with, with an almost completely reverse mantle. Um, so I would like to uh, introduce you to our panellists. We have uh, Linwin Connick, who's the First Assistant Secretary, Cyber Policy and Intelligence Division at the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Lin was, Linwin was appointed First Assistant Secretary, Cyber Policy and Intelligence in, the, in November 2013 and is responsible for cyber and intelligence issues, including the development of cyber security policy and information sharing across the national security community. She's leading the review of the Australian cyber security. We also have Helen Owens, who's principal advisor for public data policy at PMNC. Helen joined PMNC after two years working on data policy in the develop in Department of Communications. She is currently responsible for providing whole of government policy advice on the Australian government's data strategy, data infrastructure, data in the economy, and the digital government strategy. We have Samantha York, who's uh, public policy and government relations at Google. Sam works in public policy and government affairs at Google Australia with a focus on privacy, safety and security. She's an accredited mediator, technology lawyer and policy advisor with over 15 years experience working within the digital media and technology sectors both in Europe and Australia. And now the token bloke. <laughs> I bet that's never happened to you before, Nick. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs> Business Manager Information Protection, Symantec Australia and New Zealand. Nick works with organisations to develop information security strategies and solve complex business problems to make security a business enabler rather than an inhibitor. Specialising in and focusing on identity and information protection, he has in-depth knowledge of strong authentication, identity management, encryption, data loss prevention and mobility. Thank you all for coming along. I just wanted to start off by making just a, a very small number of comments on the, the RSA conference last week. As you can imagine, with the events going on between Apple and the FBI, there was a lot of discussion about privacy and security. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the, the topics here because that's kind of a very specific part of it. But there were some interesting comments. There were some of the memorable quotes of the week were from Bruce Schneier who's, um, for those of you in the security field, know that Bruce, Bruce is a, a highly regarded blogger, but also very good at uh, security. And he said, we're building an internet that thinks, senses and acts, and that senses are moving us past notice and consent. And during the week, I was starting to think about what sort of term can you think about? Because we have the data collection that people willingly give, that people are very conscious of where they fill in forms or register for a service. But there's also the data collection that is increasingly becoming involuntary. And I heard someone use the phrase ambient data collection. So that's the sort of stuff that when you're browsing online or, or when we move into the IoT, everything will be collecting information about us. The location data on the phone, even the things our cars will become endpoints. What sort of data will they collect about us? Um, and it leads us to the question then of, can people really truly give informed consent? How do they actually understand what they're giving up? So hopefully we'll get to addressing that kind of question today on the panel. Um, but there are certainly things that the industry sector is really grappling with at the moment. And people are really trying to sort this out. So without further ado, let's um, head to our panel. I would like to start by asking each panellist to briefly explain their role as it relates to the topic, which is, private, is our privacy and security and innovation mutually exclusive? Nick? Oh, yes, and I need to remind you to use the mics because it is being recorded. Thank you. Uh, I guess uh, for myself, I, I look after semantics information protection practice, and I spend a lot of time dealing with concepts around encryption and data privacy and connected devices. So actually this topic is quite, um, it's, it's quite uh, relevant to my professional but also personal interests. Uh, 
and I've been involved in this field for, for quite some time. Uh, but before I go on, I just want to say the attendance is really good for the last session of the day. So either this topic is extremely interesting or the drinks are going to be amazing. Um, yeah, so this, this, um, this area I think is something that there is a lot of activity in, but there, isn't, there hasn't been much change in the way that people are approaching the problem. And I think that we're at an opportunity now where the, we can address these issues um, through, uh, through a number of mechanisms, and I'm sure they'll come throughout, throughout the discussion uh, this afternoon. And I'd really like um, some of the questions to come from the audience particularly. I mean, we had a discussion around, uh, throughout the day around these issues. And I think I must have heard, I don't know, seven different definitions of privacy today. Um, and it means something different to everybody. Uh, and I think that's an important thing that we all must consider. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I must say on International Women's Day to have a diverse panel, we thought it was very important to have a man on the panel <laughs> because and the topic's about innovation and of course diversity breeds innovation. So I think this is something we should all be thinking about and working about is how do we get more diversity into our professions around security and innovation and information and privacy protection. Um, my role at working in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, as Jodie said, is looking after cyber policy and intelligence. I advise the Prime Minister on those issues, but also I think very relevant to today's discussion is the fact that we've been doing a review of Australia's cyber security. Um, and we've been going around Australia and internationally talking to hundreds of people. We've talked to over 200 different organisations, getting great ideas about what we need to do to improve Australia cyber security and a big part of that is about being innovative and in I guess in answer to the question are they mutually exclusive innovation privacy and security of course not would be my answer uh, and in fact I was over in the US at the Australian, Australian US business week in Silicon Valley a couple of weeks ago and one of the key messages there was innovation really depends on cyber security and cyber security depends on innovation um, we have to be innovative in our approaches to cyber security and security and privacy more generally uh, in today's world. But if we want people to adopt innovation, they have to largely trust cyberspace because most innovation will be based in cyberspace. And to build that trust, we have to have good security and privacy solutions and they must be innovative solutions. So I think that's a, a really important codependency between the two parts of today's topic. I think innovation is essential uh, for our future prosperity. It's something that's really important for Australia and I wouldn't like anyone to think that privacy and security needs to stop that. Uh, again, a very pl uh, great pleasure to be here this afternoon and um, I think I'm the sort of um, spare wheel on the panel because my um, mandate is quite different to the rest of the panel here. I run uh, a branch in Prime Minister and Cabinet called Public Data Policy Branch and essentially we were moved um, as part of machinery of government changes in October when uh, Malcolm Turnbull became the Prime Minister uh, in recognition that data is at the centre of digital um, and the digital economy and innovation. And with that, we moved a number of elements from across government into Prime Minister and Cabinet, and we've now got them just uh, housed within one branch, which I now run. We've been there since October, and we've got a pretty big mandate across government for some whole of government change around use and reuse of public data. Um, there's a, a significant implication for us in terms of privacy and security and how the public sector manages and uses its data across things like big data analytics, open data through data.gov.au and the national map, uh, but also, uh, what are we doing in terms of innovation with private sector data and what indeed does the private sector want from government in terms of access to data and how do we manage that? Um, the other element that we're looking at at the moment and happy to take some questions on later on is that uh, supporting research through trusted access to uh, 
citizen-centric data and how we do that in a very private and secure way. And we're working with the Australian Bureau of Statistics on that at, uh, at the very moment. And then the last thing that we're looking at is really, you know, what are we going to do from a blue sky perspective about uh, citizen access to their own data? And we've got some very initial thoughts about how we might move that agenda forward. But obviously, uh, front and centre is the security and, and the privacy of, of the citizen themselves. So uh, big challenges for my area and uh, uh, looking forward to some questions on all of that. Thank you, Helen. And thank you to all of you for still being here. Um, we hope to entertain you with our panel. Um, as Jody mentioned, my name is Samantha York. I work in Google's public policy team up in Sydney and have responsibility for Google's safety, privacy and security policy work here in Australia. Um, as Mike Burgess mentioned this morning in the context of his work at Telstra, Google adopt a very similar approach to how we think about privacy and security, which is that it is very much um, concerned with and driven by our customers. And we very much believe that privacy and security are two sides of the same coin. We, we think that you can only really have robust privacy protections when you have strong security measures. They're interdependent. Um, we've already talked a lot today about the relationship between privacy and security and whether or not it's an irreconcilable relationship to use a common divorce parlance. <laughs> um, but we very much believe that they are um, critically interdependent. And I look forward to talking more about that in the next little while. While you have the mic, Sam, would yes. you like to talk about... Um what Google does to support innovation, and given that we are probably going to run over time like the others, um, but we're, we're, we don't really want to, um, talk, I think, specifically about innovation in terms of security and privacy. Um, I might give just two examples, if that's all right, Jody. And again, I'm yes. conscious that we're running a wee bit behind time. But um, one of the um, innovations that we've invested a lot of time and energy in at Google is um, working across the industry um, in an organization called the FIDO Alliance, which is a conglomerate of um, representatives from the technology industry, the security industry, and the financial services industry to develop um, open, interoperable, uh, next generation security standards. And this is a lovely example of the work the FIDO Alliance have been doing. This is small, so apologies for those of you in the back who can't see it. But this is, this is a security key. It's essentially a little USB stick um, that we encourage um, all Gmail account holders to use as a second factor form of authentication on their accounts. And what that means, I'm conscious of using jargon, we've also heard a lot about jargon today. Um, essentially, we believe that it is critically important to have an additional layer of security protecting your information in your Google account. You have a password. We all know there are vulnerabilities around the use of passwords these days, so we encourage the use of something like a security key as a second step to, to verify that you are who you say you are. And essentially, it, um, it is just establishing proof of presence. So you stick it into your USB um, hole port on your laptop, you enter your password as you would normally do, and then you receive a prompt to touch your key. So you literally just touch it, and that registers that you are physically present at that computer at the time that your password has been entered. And we think this is pretty effective, actually, at combating a very large percentage of um, phishing attempts, malware attempts, key logging software, and so on. So that's, that's something we're very proud of being involved in the development of. My second example is related to privacy. Um, I think Dawn mentioned in our last session um, the challenge that the technology industry, and in fact many industries have with privacy policies now. Um, they are long documents, they're often drafted by lawyers, and um, at Google we launched a new website uh, last year called My Account 
which is essentially an experiment um, to reimagine what a privacy policy might look like, to make the delivery of information about how Google is using data into something that is, first of all, um, easy to understand, <laughs> that's written in plain English, that's interactive, so as a user or a consumer, you can um, go specifically to a, a, a piece of information you're interested in. It might be location-based data, or if you just need a little bit more hand-holding, you can actually go through a step-by-step -step checkup for both privacy and security. And this is really essentially revisiting um, any choices you've made in the past about how your data is being used by Google and what data you have given to Google in the past. It allows you to update that data, change it, um, change your mind about how you want your data to be used and exercise some control there. So. This was really an, an, what we think is an, an innovative experiment to bring all of those privacy and security settings in one place that is easy to understand and that gives information and control over to, um, to Google users in one place that um, is accessible to them. So we, we try hard to be innovative in thinking about um, how we approach privacy and security and how we empower Google users to make informed decisions about their privacy and security. So I think that, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is that that then enables the user to determine what level of privacy they want. Um, the question I had for you is one of the comments made last week is that although people have privacy settings, they very rarely change them. Um, what's been your experience with that? So we, we've seen a lot of people come to the site and um, a smaller number of people actually changing settings, which is kind of interesting to us. So um, we think there's a huge value there in just providing information and demystifying a lot of the data collection practices that, that exist, and that people come to the site, they look for an answer to a specific question, or they may go through that step-by-step -step checkup, um, but it may not necessarily result in them making any changes, but at least they come out the other end having answered a question or um, reassured themselves that they've made um, decisions in the past that they still believe to be true or to be uh, appropriate for how they're using our services. Okay, thanks. Helen. One very exciting thing for us is, as I talked about our cybersecurity review, and we plan to release a strategy soon, a new Australian cybersecurity strategy, but the government's already invested in one of our initiatives, which is a cybersecurity growth centre. $30 million was allocated under the National Innovation and Science Agenda to uh, implement a cybersecurity growth centre based on the government's growth centre model. There's growth centres for other sectors. And this is all about innovation. It's about connecting researchers with startups, with venture capitalists, with big businesses who have problems. Um, it's about enabling new innovative cybersecurity solutions to be developed, connecting Australian cybersecurity companies with international markets, but also enabling bigger businesses who want to do something differently online and want to do it securely connect with those people who can develop solutions for them. And the aim here is to have Australian solutions that we can then you know, export, uh, sell within Australia and export. We think this is really exciting. This is the first initiative that we're implementing, but it's a very exciting one. And we often talk about the themes that have come out during our consultations in our cybersecurity review and the importance of cybersecurity to enable growth and prosperity in Australia both because we have a lot of innovative people who are doing clever things that we can develop solutions for, but also because the way new business models are working, uh, you need to adopt disruptive technologies, do things differently online, and people are not going to embrace those if they're not done securely. So we think this is a very important step in developing innovation in Australia and innovation in cybersecurity. So it's a very important part uh, of what we're trying to deliver. It's, um, it brings up an interesting thing, and I don't want to get too far away from the main topic, but it brings me to a, some of my thoughts around why we have issues in uh, fostering innovation within startups in Australia. And I think one of the problems we have is 
it, it's similar to the information sharing problem we have in organisations, and that is procurement policies really are unfriendly towards startups within Australia. Um, and the requirements to do business with government and to do business with enterprise really restrict the smaller entries. And people who are innovating um, and creating things uh, here uh, are unable to transact at a commercial level with organisations. And once that happens, if you, there's no money coming in, there's only so much uh, VC runway that you're going to have. Um, I guess in terms of compatibility with privacy and security, I, I just want to go back to the idea that they are related issues. Um, I think there's a, often a problem that people, when it comes to associating technology to those two things, they often mistake encryption as making privacy and security the same thing, and they're not. Encryption is a tool. It's not something that gives you privacy. It's not something that gives you security. It is a tool that is used in those systems. Uh, and definitely to go back uh, to what you were saying, in that good privacy and good security drive innovation in two ways. One, I think that there is uh, a great opportunity for innovation in the security and privacy tools that need to be developed for the next generation of technologies. We, we talk a lot about IoT, the ubiquitous uh, connectivity and ubiquitous monitoring and data collection and it requires a new set of tools, a new set of privacy controls and security controls, and new analytics to look for the anomalous behaviour within those systems. Uh, so there is one side of innovation which is focused at delivering security and privacy enhancing technologies. But on the other side, there is um, security and privacy tools that need to be developed, uh, that uh, sorry, are, are applied to enable innovation in other sectors. Uh, if we look at, for example, healthcare, and we're doing research uh, today um, in, the, in the medical sciences, nearly all of that is based on big data analytics. Now, how do I protect that data? How do I ensure the privacy of the people who I'm collecting that information from? Well, under a rigorous privacy framework, under rigorous security, I can actually perform that, that, um, that research and drive innovation in that space. So I think privacy and security are not... Um, uh, uh, are not opposites to, uh, uh, to innovation. They are not detractors from innovation. In fact, they are enablers of innovation. I mean, even if you look back at throughout history, there's been a need for privacy and security, all going back to the cipher sticks, you know, between you know, ancient Greek generals communicating um, with scrolls. Uh, the, the need for that, it was, it's all about collaboration, and I think good privacy and security, people have this mis misunderstanding that um, uh, privacy restricts the flow of information, but I, I think that's wrong. Privacy sets a framework up that allows the sharing of information in an effective manner, and I think that's one other thing that we have a problem with in Australia, uh, is that we heard earlier today about information sharing. It doesn't really happen very effectively in Australia in the private sector. Um, organisations are, uh, are reluctant to share information between their peers and, um, and, with the, and with the public in terms of threat and risk and security information. I don't know how we got to that, but um, <laughs> we, we kind of did. And, oh, and I was just looking at the, the little FIDO tokens you mentioned. I think the biggest innovation coming out of FIDO is not the, the, the FOB type developments, it's really the work being done around biometrics. Uh, biometrics have an opportunity to really change the way consumers interact with uh, services. And uh, as a, uh, you know, I, from the Symantec perspective, I, I'm one of the key advocates of FIDO within the organisation. Um, and we recently joined the FIDO Alliance to really push that uh, biometric boundary because the interests from people, consumers really want um, for, to have a biometric. And it's not because they care about security. It's because they want convenience. Users are lazy, I am lazy. I want to look at my phone, I want it to unlock. I want it to walk up to my computer, I want it to unlock. I want the Star Trek experience. Right? I walk up to the computer, do my bidding computer, and it does my, does my bidding for me. But I want that to be safe. And initiatives like the FIDO Alliance, who are putting great security frameworks, like on, you know, requiring things like on-device biometrics, etc., cetera, um, are really, helping drive innovation in that space.
So that's kind of a neat segue, some of the things you said. Do you, do you think consumers are more aware of privacy than they've been in the past or that they think differently about privacy these days? I tweeted earlier today, um, awareness isn't, someone said that awareness is the problem. I don't think awareness is the problem. I think it's care. Um, people are aware, they just don't care um, in many circumstances. Um, or they don't care enough. Or they don't think they have the ability to control and they give up. It's just part of the human condition, I think, to think that I, I can't change the machinery and I will accept that. Uh, and I, I challenge anyone in this room to tell me you have not put a fake date of birth in a website. Anyone not ever put a fake date of birth in a website? One guy at the, the back there, right? Uh, why do we do things like that? Because we feel that our privacy is at risk when we provide information. But um, to um, look at what Rachel was saying earlier today, um, that that is, gets in the way of what the consumer wants to do. The consumer's going to do what they want to do. No one, how many friends do you have on Facebook who every now and then go, I'm quitting Facebook. If you want to communicate with me, send me a message or call me or meet me in person. Happens every six months, somebody does that. And they all come back. Why? Because they want the functionality. And they trade, they do their grand bargain in their head and they make that trade. So I think it's not an awareness issue. I think there is a, a feeling of lack of ability to control, a lack of uh, ability to influence. And the grand bargain of, this is big enough. They should know what they're doing, right? Uh, and a lot of the concerns, sometimes what I find about the IT industry is that we all expect everyone to think the way we do. Right? We all expect everyone to think as data practitioners, security practitioners. Um, the reality is we're a special case. We don't think the same way that everybody else does. The concerns that we have are different to everybody else. I mean, I go to, I go to a barbecue and people ask me, oh, where do you, where do you work? I said, I work for Symantec. Oh, yeah. You know, the tick, yeah, oh, yeah, that, those guys, huh? You know, I had a problem with my computer the other day. Um, <laughs> right? That's the, the, the thought process is different to the thought processes that we deal with because uh, there is such an inundation that the consumer is facing of information uh, today that it, it is very hard for them to make choices. And I think they feel, if you look at the surveys that have been done both... Um, from research uh, uh, institutions and from um, uh, vendor surveys and market surveys uh, done by marketers, you'll see that privacy and security are the number one concern for people doing things online and yet no one is disconnecting from the internet, right? More and more usage is happening. Why? Because they want that functionality and I think that the grand bargain is slightly uninformed in terms of what people are trading up for that. The, the Pew Research Centre in the US has done some really interesting work on consumer attitudes to privacy and they found that um, a very high number of people express a strong degree of care about privacy but a disproportionately low number of people actually take action to, to, to manipulate their privacy settings or to even revisit them. So the level of care seems to still be quite high, but the level of action seems to be quite low. And I think it speaks to a point you made earlier, Nick, which is that um, 20 years ago we had pretty much a uniform understanding of what privacy means, whereas today uh, privacy means different things to different people. And even in this room, I don't think we have a consensus about what privacy means to each of us. It's very contextual. Um, I don't think it does conform to um, age. I think somebody made a point earlier today. Um, a lot of young people care a lot about their privacy and they know where to go to change their settings or to turn behavioural advertising off. Um, I just think it means different things to different people now and it is very hard when you think about privacy as a regulatory issue to come up with a very common consensus on what privacy means and how it should be protected. I just want to go back to something that Nick mentioned um, around innovation and startups and the procurement process. Let's just start there and then I'll come to the uh, privacy thing. 
Um, so through the National Innovation and Science Agenda, the government did announce that the Digital Transformation Office will have a digital marketplace. And that um, initiative is about to be announced, um, you know, in the next little while. And our hope is, and my area is working with the Digital Transformation Office and the Department of Finance on new processes around ICT procurement and how we can actually support innovation through better, quicker, more easy um, uh, access to government business for startups. So um, hopefully what you wish for is coming. Um, in terms of our interaction in the data policy area with, with citizens, um, we found, um, we did a sort of independent study, um, went out and asked a few people about what uh, they thought about government using uh, their data across agencies. And the interesting thing was that more and more people actually want government to be doing that. Um, and we've had a long debate in Australia about things like the Australia card and its predecessor, and it's, it's always been a bit tricky. Um, but what we're seeing is a move towards uh, a sentiment of, yes, I would actually like to tell the government once where I live and what my tax file number is, and I'd like that data or, and what I tell government to be shared across agencies so that every time I go into an agency, I don't have to repeat myself over and over again. Um, and so what we're seeing is a bit of a turnaround in terms of uh, integrating data within government. One of the interesting things was late last year, we released a, a report uh, into public sector data management. And within that report, there's some um, details about the fact that right now, we are developing a longitudinal data set um, at the unit record level across uh, social security, tax, um, and uh, a range of other um, agencies. And initially, when we published that report, we thought that there would be a, a hue and outcry about privacy and how dare you use my data in that way. Um, but essentially, we've heard crickets about that. So I, I think there is a changing sentiment in terms of government using data internally. And, um, and because of the way that technology is going, we need to be, um, you know, supporting the citizen in getting, giving access to their data as well, so. Um, just, just one point on this. I think, you know, there's a few different issues here. I think, you know, my experience is that most people are aware of privacy risks, particularly when they're doing things online, but they're not always aware of the cyber security risks, how their information is protected, what they do, what measures they put in place might impact their privacy. So that's one thing we've heard from a lot of people is that awareness is not there. People don't understand what they need to do. It's not just about privacy settings on your social media application. There's a whole lot of other things that can risk your privacy and people don't always understand that. Um, and I think also there's as well as the awareness, people, I know from my own point of view, want uh, the new services that are provided uh, when we share our data. You know, I th think it's wonderful when I wake up in the morning that the app on my phone tells me it's a 10 minute drive to work, the traffic's light, the weather's fine. I like the way that it knows where I work. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when the app on my phone, as I walk past the dress shop, will tell me the dress I tried on last week is now half price. <laughs> Uh, I want those sorts of services and I think a lot of people like that and we're willing to sacrifice some privacy but we also want to be able to control that privacy. We don't want everyone to know that we bought the dress at half price. So, you know, it's about balance and how we educate people and what sort of provisions we can put in place. I, I sort of wonder whether um, people would feel so comfortable about um, trusting people with their data if they heard some of the things I heard during the week from companies who completely fessed up to the fact that the security industry is not really pulling its weight in terms of how it develops its code and its applications and the architectures they use. Um, there was even a, a startup that confessed on a panel that even their first version of their product didn't use HTTPS. Um, I heard a, a, a software tool vendor say that it's really actually too hard for industry when they're innovating to develop secure code, it takes them longer, which was a surprising view from a software vendor. 
So my question is, you know, who is, who is actually responsible for ensuring that the security and privacy that we talk about and the ability to put those mechanisms in place so people can have trust in, in the digital economy, whose responsibility is that? Well, I, I think the responsibility lies with all of the participants in the market. I don't think you can uh, uh, pinpoint an individual or a regulator or a, a single organisation or body that is responsible uh, because I think that will lead to failure. That is the way the old world used to work. It's not the way the new world works. Um, and, you know, we were... I was in the Stream B earlier today listening about... Um, listening to ubiquitous connectivity and IoT uh, um, devices and whatnot. And you know, these are really big areas that are changing the way that we think. Uh, if we look at the, the question that you're posing is who's responsible? Well, I think that the market will try and solve some of this itself. Um, and I'm going to draw a fairly long bow analogy. You know, it may make more sense after you've had a couple of beers at the drinks. Um, and just look at the way banks market themselves. When was the last time you saw an ad for a bank showing someone in a queue waiting to talk to a teller? Never. Right? They're like wild horses or kids you know, playing soccer or someone on a yacht. It's all about empowering your world and being there for you. No one cares about that, really. Right? They want to do their banking and they want a loan and they want to be able to have quick, easy money to their access to their money and they want to know that their banks aren't going to go broke. Um, the marketing is not to, uh, really around the core banking functions. Uh, and I think we're going to see that sort of translation ha happen in the consumer space uh, around security. When we talk about connected devices, connected platforms, about people offering a higher level of security in their platforms. I mean, it was even suggested that the whole thing with Apple and the FBI is a marketing activity to drive... Um, to drive business, for people to go and buy iPhones, right? Now, um, I think we're going to see a lot more increase in that, and that'll be the market itself. Uh, it'll be the market itself that's dealing with that. The problem is, is who do I trust? Um, and how much do I believe the marketing? And how do I verify? You know, the whole principle of trust but verify. Um, how do I know these guys are doing the right thing? People want to believe that every... The, you know, Company's big enough, it's doing the right thing, but we've seen time and time again big data breaches, people are getting popped, there's, you know, writing hard, good software is hard, uh, understanding all the threat vectors is hard, and then you have um, the wetware, which will always let you down, right? Um, and uh, enable the, the bad guys to pop an environment. Uh, on the other side is the consumer wants to make sure they're buying something that is safe and secure or has at least the same sort of security, they go, I go, I go to Target and I buy a toaster and I plug it in, it doesn't switch all the lights off in my house and you know, burn it down. They want the same sort of security when they buy a toy for their kid that takes photos, they want to know that they're going to, they're going to plug in their toy bear, it's going to take photos and they're, they're not going to end up in the hands of uh, some Eastern European hackers. Um, now, I think, the mar like I said, the market I think will try to regulate some of that itself. Um, but I think there, there is a role for... Um, I'm a bit reluctant to say legislation because the legislation really lags. It takes forever to catch up. I mean, things change. Things are changing on a weekly to monthly basis in terms of the way things are being developed. Uh, legislation is a much longer process and there is a risk that uh, prescriptive legislation is uh, would be out of date by the time it ever gets discussed, uh, let alone by the time it's implemented. So I think the adoption of frameworks and independent advice uh, and advisory bodies, um, you know, you see things like um, uh, consumer bodies who who talk about the quality of products, I think there'll be an expansion of that sort of thing to talk about the security um, and trustworthiness of an organisation. Uh, yeah, so I think that's a very long answer to a really 
good question. Unfortunately, I don't think it's a complete answer. Um, Lynn or Sam, Helen, did you have some comment on that topic? Um, I, I agree. I think it's, um, it's everyone's responsibility. It's a joint responsibility um, to protect privacy. I'm sure, as many of you know, governments introducing mandatory data breach reporting that's been out for consultation. I think the responses were due back last week. Um, there are challenges in making things mandatory when it comes to this sort of reporting, and so it's very good to get everyone's views on that and how do you implement you know, regulations. But more broadly, I think we all have responsibility for our own privacy. We choose you know, what applications we use. We all need to be aware um, and knowledgeable in the choices we make to protect our own privacy. We can't assume that government will do it for us or necessarily that all of the services we use will do it for us. We all have to be responsible in this. Uh, yep, so from the uh, use of public data, or government data, uh, we have very, you know, rigid frameworks around uh, the use of personal data. Um, it's enshrined in lots of different bits of legislation. Um, and, you know, that I think that's our responsibility in terms of making sure that the citizens are confident that government is using their data in alignment with privacy principles. I think that's our, our job. Um, but I agree with, with uh, Limwen and Nick that in terms of the private sector, um, I think, you know, it is everybody's responsibility. Um, I, I was listening earlier today to someone, uh, someone saying that we were talking about location data on your smartphone and so on. Um, you know, I think that um, there's opportunity, you can turn off location services on any mobile app that you've got. So you, right there you've got a choice whether you want to be followed around or whether you want to have what Lindman's services are about telling her where she's going and how long it's going to take to get there. You can actually choose to switch that off and most people know that. Um, but uh, fundamentally, um, people want these services and um, in terms of privacy, I think, you know, personal responsibility and, uh, and private sector responsibility is just as, as important. One of the things that we're thinking about in the future in terms of access to citizen-centric government data is actually putting the hands, putting the data in the hands of the citizen and allowing them to decide who has access to it. And one of the concepts uh, that we're looking at is what they have in, in Estonia where, um, you know, they use blockchain me methodologies to uh, provide government citizen data to the citizen themselves via an API. Um, and then the citizen decides who has access to that data through APIs themselves. Um, and the blockchain method methodology means that the citizen itself can can see who's actually using the data, uh, the government data that's uh, about them, um, and they can see how their data is being moved around government. And so it's putting in, putting the kind of uh, citizen in charge of their own data, which is a, a sort of you know early concept stage that we're thinking about. I wholeheartedly agree with the views of my esteemed panel members. Um, it's, it's, of course, a shared responsibility. Um, and I guess as an industry representative, the ways in which industry contribute to, to that shared responsibility are by developing products with privacy in mind. We've, we've spoken about privacy by design already today. Um, it's also incumbent upon industry to provide control back to users and consumers to give them tools where they can make informed choices about what how their data is being used and to also showcase positive examples of the way that data as a tool is being used to innovate and demonstrate the benefit to consumers for for using data for these innovative purposes. Sorry, we're just coordinating. <laughs> Thank you. So it seems like we have consensus on that, that matter, so that's good. And then the question is getting the information out to people so they can make those choices in an informed way. Uh, we have a question or well, a thanks. comment. Steve Wilson from Constellation. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that the, privacy, that the, the security industry um, takes a bit of a dim view about user behaviour. Um, <clears throat> we collectively tend to blame users for the, for the bad choices that they make on privacy and, and um, 
Samantha put it really well that people seem to have an awareness of the privacy problems, but they don't act. I think the missing piece in all of this um, is there, and it's, um, it's human behaviour change theory. So smart people, well-informed people smoke, and well-informed people eat too much and we drink too much, and public health officials understand this, <clears throat> and there's a big body of work around behaviour change theory, and I think it's a missing piece in security. I, I think that the security industry needs to stop scratching its head about people because they're complicated, right? It's, it's wetware. That p people are not algorithmic, and um, I'm just wondering whether the panel wants to broaden its, you know, perspectives around that kind of question. Yeah, I, I saw you itching to ask a question there, uh, Steve, and I, I, I agree with you. Um, far too much security has been applied in an academic nature without consideration of the wetware behind the keyboard. Um, and uh, I always say to people, the wetware will always let you down. And I, you know, all three vices that you discussed I used to suffer from, and now I only suffer from two. I drink too much and I eat too much. Um, uh, I know I smoke though, which is, um, which is very good. I, I, I came to my senses, um, even though I, I would consider myself informed. Um, the human behaviour when it comes to security matters has the way that the industry has approached changing it has been um, flawed. We have tried to teach people security practices by once a year sending them an email going, have you read the policy? Have you read section 17.C of the acceptable use policy of your employment contract? Yes, I have. Have you? Of course you have. What does it mean? It means nothing, right? And then you have these contrived videos of, um, I'm going to sit through a video for my compliance training on information security and I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna watch the video. Yeah, right, I put it to my second monitor because now the tools have, you can't skip through the videos because they realized everyone was just skipping through the videos and answering the contrived questions at the end, which they then go and do the exact opposite of in the real world. They make you watch the video, so it goes all the way through. So you just put it to your second monitor and put your earphones in and do something else um, while you do your real work, right? That's the way we've tried to teach security and change behaviour. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because people don't care, because they don't understand, and they just think that's another thing that gets in the way of them doing their stuff, right? That's an hour that I don't get to work on my spreadsheet or on my report or on my project. Um, so there has been a, a shift and it's something that um, I've been personally involved in um, from, a, from a technology perspective to try and change that and we've seen, um, we've seen how this has worked in the health industry. Why is Fitbit successful? Why are all these health trackers successful? Because they've turned it into the gamification of those things. It's turned it into a game. And people are trying to encourage human behaviour. It's that reward. Oh, I've got a star. How awesome is that? I'm teaching my son how to toilet. I'm toilet training my son. And it's exactly the same principle. You went to the potty, here's a sticker. Right? You went to the gym, here's a star in your app. Right? Um, and I think the same approach, if we take that and apply it to security understandings and security learnings, I think we'll have a much better result than we have traditionally. Um, and uh, I've personally been involved with some of the efforts that we've been making at Symantec to try and change the way we do that. Because for many years, you know, it's a, it was a, that's the way you did it, right? I don't know how many, have, I'm sure everyone knows about the videos I'm talking about, like the training videos or the surveys or the questionnaires. You've all done them. And do you remember any of them? Except for the really lame video, that's the only thing that you remember from it. Um, and we're all professional IT people here. Imagine what your average user um, who thinks that this is just an, uh, something that gets in their way, what their recall of that information is. It's next to nothing. Um, and uh, I think that has to change. We can't keep blaming the users. Uh, the users are part of they are part of the problem, but they're part of the solution, and we need to treat them as such with the respect that they deserve. Um, and it's far too easy to say, the wetware is bad, it will always let you down. Let's cut off access to the wetware. It's not going to work. We need to acknowledge there is a problem, 
and we have to try and fix that. I'd just like to second your view that the human factor is a very important component of cyber security, security more broadly, privacy. You know, drawing on my experience as a cyber security practitioner, we always found the most effective way to change people's behaviour was to demonstrate to them what could be done, not, you know, roll out a rule book with a whole lot of mandatory practices or the, the surveys that people don't want to do. Um, it's, it's about demonstration. Interestingly, we're talking to some people this week about the importance of telling stories in, you know, security education. And I think there's a lot of work being done on this and it's a very important part of work to make sure that we recognise the importance of the human factor. I'd just say, Steve, you're right. A lot of this is oh user behaviour and I don't think any of us intended to blame the user, but um, it takes time, it takes time to, to affect wide scale behavioural change. And in the meantime, we'll continue to remind people that these tools exist, um, using opportunities like Safer Internet Day, Cyber Security Awareness Week, um, and, and also um, I think unfortunately this is kind of one of those lessons that a lot of people learn by, by a bad mistake really. My mother-in-law recently was the victim of quite a sophisticated um, hack and she's learnt now she needs to take security pretty seriously and I think she will but unfortunately I think a lot of this is a theoretical risk for people and until they're the victim um, they don't necessarily appreciate how important it is to, to take precautions. It's the whole, it'll never happen to me mentality, I think, that uh, affects people that we need to try and address rather than try and beat them over the head with a stick with policies and procedures, is understand that it can happen to you. Yeah. 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 So um, we do have another question. I'll quickly say before then, if you ever get the chance to hear Craig Davies speak on this, this um, CISO from Atlassian, he's, he's got some really good things to say on this and, and I can talk to you later about some of the things that he does. Uh, we had another question. Yes. Uh, Mike Faulkner here from Verizon and uh, I'd, I'd really like to thank, uh, was it Steve, for, for the question. Um, some of the responses seem to go to um, uh, security from a global perspective, people who work in multinational corporations, etc. Um, my question is to the, to the rest of the population who perhaps don't have access to the mandatory um, security training that we're supposed to do, and specifically uh, for Linwin. Um, you know, I have teenage children and uh, they will always just click the button which to accept the terms and conditions, etc. And I'm, I, I fear that we may have lost a generation. They have already just turned on to a, a mindset where they, they accept um, uh, uh, what's provided to them with a the belief that uh, organisations are looking after my security. So I'm interested in how that type of thinking may factor into um, the cybersecurity strategy, if at all. One of the things we've been hearing from people is the need to raise awareness more broadly across the community. So it's not just about government or business, it's about you know, everyone at home, how do they do what they need to do to protect themselves online? So we think that's a very important thing to do. Talking about having teenagers, I have teenagers as well. Mine are a bit different to yours. Mine are very reluctant to do um, things online. They often tell me, don't do that, Mum, you shouldn't be doing that. Um, they've been trained very well at school to be very uh, cautious about what they do online. And I think that is something that is happening in the education system and is a very important part of our education system because that means a new generation of people will grow up with a lot more awareness but you know we're looking at what we can do more broadly to promote awareness of security and privacy issues. We have one last question. Thanks. So I was just wondering if we could go into the future a bit and pretend we're having this same event 10 or 15 years from now. I'm just curious which of these same topics might still be relevant versus ones that may be completely obsolete or what kind of new topics might come on the table. So maybe Sam and Helen, if we could get a private sector and maybe a public sector perspective. I know obviously you do Google's job and obviously Helen with your work, you're sort of thinking ahead. Um, what, what do you think those new issues might be and what issues might be resolved 10 years down the road? Uh, tough question. Um, that's okay. <laughs> 
Um, so if I was sitting here 10 years hence, um, I would see um, that we would be um, much more sophisticated in our uh, access to public data. Um, I would see that uh, the digital economy has probably developed some, you know, the Internet of Things will have developed quite significantly, so we will have learned a lot. I think the issue about privacy is a moving uh, feast, and I, you know, I think it's difficult to predict. I mean, who would have predicted five or ten years ago that we'd all be wearing wearables and, you know, all of that data would be, you know, somewhere in the cloud? Um, but my view is that um, the the issue about people wanting to keep their their data private will be still there, um, and we'll be still having the conversation. It just might mean that there is a different methodology or technical solution around how that plays out. Um, the other thing that I guess from our perspective, from the public sector, I would hope that in 10 years hence, we are so much more mature in terms of um, uh, building a research capability for the country that allows researchers secure access to unit record level data and then that data that they subsequently generate does not need to be destroyed on the basis that it's private and can't be used um, sort of into the future. Right now what we have is um, a researcher will come to government, ask for some data that they want to use for research. They would have multiple um, uh, memorandums of understanding with potentially five or six or eight agencies. It takes two years to get that data together. Um, and then they anal do analysis over, run algorithms through it, do a whole lot of work. And at the end of that research, everything they've done has to be destroyed. Um, ten years hence, I would hope that is absolutely not the case, that we would be able to um, encourage researchers into uh, a secure platform and then that data that they generate is then there for future analysis and research as well. Great question, and I should disclose at the outset that I am an optimist, so I will be painting a rosy picture of the future. <laughs> Um, I hope that in 10, 15 years' time, um, society at large will have a much better and deeper understanding of these issues and a higher degree of awareness around the control and the, the tools and resources that are available to them to exercise um, control over how their data is being used. Um, we will hopefully have seen in that time um, some totally awe-inspiring examples of how data can be used for good and that that in turn will result in an increased level of trust in, in pr the private sector and government's use of data. And that I guess similarly, you know, of course there will be incidents and breaches along the way as well and that we will all continue to learn from those mistakes and that will just form part of a much more mature approach to these issues. They will remain, there will always be concerns around security and privacy, but my hope is that the general level of understanding is a lot higher than we see today, and that these conversations aren't just had once a year amongst a couple of hundred of us who are pretty savvy about these issues, but that it will be a much more common public conversation and dialogue. And can I add the academic voice to this? that uh, there's already research going on as we speak, and I also confess to being an optimist, I couldn't do my job if I wasn't, um, that there is already research going on that would enable researchers to use things like synthetic data, so data sets that are generated with the same statistical um, characteristics of a data set you want to use, um, and other ways to preserve the privacy of the data while still doing analysis on it. Um, so I'm optimistic that they will actually be quite mature and, and uh, doing a very good job for us by then.